sometimes a person has thoughts of repentance and a desire for God in a certain place. Right there in that place, the person must then strengthen himself with thoughts of repentance and a desire for God. That is, he must say a few words of prayer or verbally express his spiritual desire and longing. Depending on the context, he should not wait or leave the spot. This is true even if the particular place is not especially conducive to prayer. One may have such thoughts and feelings when he is not in a synagogue or a house of Torah, but on the road or the like. Nevertheless, once he moves, he can interrupt the thought and lose it. We saw Rebbe himself follow the above advice many times. This is a great, great teaching on place. It's interesting because it doesn't seem to have anything to do with place on the surface of it. It seems almost incidental. It's not like a sense of place or finding a particular place. He simply says that any time you find yourself in any place and the thought of God occurs to you, honor it on the spot. Don't take another step further. So we may ask the question, why? Why would you stop before moving on? And the answer is, is quite simple. Because at every moment of our lives, roads diverge. Paths branch. And at those moments that we have the thought of God, those are the moments when we are literally choosing which path to go down. And we stop at those moments and honor that thought. We're basically asking for guidance any time that the thought of God occurs to us. Any time the thought of the divine, thought of the Buddha, any time that um, wakefulness reaches up within us like a hand inside of a glove and lays hold of our being, we are meant to, to honor that by recognizing it and uh, answering, answering that call. Years ago, uh, when I was uh, living in Daivasatsu Zendo, actually it's even before I started living there, uh, this was back in the early 80s, I was doing a session there, a seven-day silent retreat. And at this particular retreat, So in Nakagawa Roshi was uh, present. He had uh, flown in from Japan for this retreat. And long about the sixth or seventh day, uh, I'm sitting there, and he would appear out of nowhere like a ghost. He was so quiet and so small and made absolutely no noise. So suddenly, he would just be standing in back of you, and you wouldn't know where he'd come from. Suddenly you'd be aware that he was standing right in back of you. So this happened to me. I guess he must have been walking very, very slowly, like about one footstep every 30 or 45 seconds. So still and so quiet, like a tree moving, that he suddenly was at my back. And I was aware he was there. And then I felt his finger touch me on my back, right to the left of my right shoulder blade. And he touched my back and pushed it gently, and I felt my spine come into a slightly different alignment, and the pain and the discomfort that I've been feeling instantly disappeared. And I sat like that. I thought I was sitting straight, because the fact of the matter is that we don't really see ourselves very clearly. Zazen and the Zazen posture is a metaphor for this. The posture in itself, I mean, so it brings our chakras in alignment, it, you know, it, that generally promotes good health, deep breathing, relaxation, these things are all valuable. But there's a deeper level on which the posture of meditation is, is, uh, is profoundly and deeply symbolic. We don't really know how we're sitting or whether we're in balance or whether we're leaning slightly to one side until we find ourselves in the correct alignment and then suddenly it feels right, it feels good and we realize, oh, that's it. Before I thought I was upright, but I wasn't. It's like that a lot in life. That fingertip in my back was just exactly like what Rev. Nachman is talking about here. When the thought of God, when the, when the impulse to uh, reconnect 
and to situate ourselves in the present moment, honor that, and to be real there, uh, comes. At that very moment, if we simply honor it and accept it, then we know the right way to go. It's not a, it's not a very uh, difficult teaching, not a very subtle teaching, not a very hard teaching, but a very profound one nevertheless. And so, Rev. Nachman says, this is true even if the particular place is not especially conducive to prayer. I would say it's true especially if the place is not conducive to prayer. Okay, the places where we're not likely to maintain our meditative awareness are the places it's most needed. Um, I have teenage children and there are many opportunities. Places are not always literal. Sometimes it can be a mental space. Like when somebody says something that uh, you find irritating, okay? Or if you're a parent, if your authority is challenged, that's a good moment. That's a good place. It's a good place in which to have the thought of God and to respond accordingly. The key point, though, right here is at the end of chapter 15. It says, we saw the Rebbe himself follow the above advice many times. For me, that's really the key statement. Because what that says is that uh, he practiced what he taught. You know, people always say, practice what you preach. And it, it's sort of like, um, people say that, and it's, it's, it's very judgmental usually when people say that. They say, practice what you preach. In other words, you say one thing and you do another. Don't do that. Do what you say. But that's not really the right way to look at it. The right way to look at it is that if we teach what, if we, we do what we say and say what we do, then the whole picture is coherent. So if we offer a teaching, we say, well, you should practice, you should get up in the middle of the night, you should practice. Okay, it's fine to say that. If you actually do it, even if you just do it sometimes, then it becomes very, very powerful. A very small, simple teaching is, if done, if performed with some sort of fidelity and honesty, is very, very powerful. It doesn't take anything very, very profound. Very small teaching, if one actually does. So what they're saying is that we watch the Rebbe do this. We watch him simply stop. And you could tell that he was reconnecting briefly with God and then going on. So the thing to do is to find those moments, to allow them to occur, and simply to honor them. And in the honoring them, you actually are teaching them to people, even if people don't know exactly what you're doing. Even if people even if you don't explain anything, even if you don't say a word. So when I give a teaching like this, I ask myself, well, what, what am I allowed to teach? It's a very good question. What am I allowed to teach? We should all ask ourselves that question. What do you actually practice? <clears throat> Therefore, what are you allowed to teach? I think I can really only teach one thing, and that is constant prayer. That's what I do, constant prayer. Oh, my baby.